Well, we are all fed from lunch there. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm certainly enjoyed it there. Um, ben here, VK7BN, is our uh, benevolent dictator at uh, the Radio and Electronics Association, <laughs> El Presidente. Um, <laughs> so he was a natural fit to uh, get to help run this mini conf with me uh, this year. And um, so uh, we decided that uh, see if we can get some more people interested in uh, the hobby which we spend so much time and money um, <laughs> uh, involved with. Uh, so we'd see if we can get some more people involved with that. And so Ben here is uh, to, going to talk to see if uh, any of you guys are ready for amateur radio. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I, I hope everyone's enjoying LCA so far. Um, obviously, um, my name's Ben. I have a call sign of VK7BEN. And not only am I El Presidente of the Radio and Electronics Association, which has its club rooms up on the domain, I'm also a WIA learning facilitator and a uh, radio and electronics school mentor. So today I'm sort of asking the question of, are you ready for amateur radio? And probably one of the things you need to think about if you're ready for amateur radio is why would you be interested in it? Uh, well, there are a couple of things that could be interesting about it. And uh, one of them is wireless communication. Um, now, this can be done through voice. I mean, heck, I'm doing it right now with this microphone on, if you want to think of it that way. Um, but certainly some of the far more interesting aspects of um, wireless communication that these days are telemetry and data. Um, there are some, particularly with the miniaturisation of um, electronics, uh, things like the Arduinos, the system on boards like the Raspberry Pis, um, are opening up uh, wireless communication to all sorts of interesting sensors and data telemetry applications. Um, as well as that, there is uh, remote control. And remote control, I'm not really talking about the remote control cars or drones and, and planes and the like, uh, but remote controlling of radio equipment. Um, you heard uh, Paul talk a little bit before about a ham live there. Um, and we, you can use that to access uh, radio stations remotely, um, but again also remote control of um, sensors and devices which you might have out, out in the field. And um, I certainly know there'll be some conversation about a little bit about that in some of our later presentations and panels. Um, so I should start off with a little bit about what is the radio spectrum. So the radio spectrum is anywhere from zero hertz uh, frequency, so uh, that's effectively your DC power, um, all the way up to 10 to the power of 15 terahertz, which has a much more friendly name of gamma rays, but it's certainly not friendly on you if you actually get in the way of them. <laughs> um, probably something interesting in amongst all that is that between 430 and 470 terahertz, that's the actual visible light spectrum, all the way from your infrared to your, oh, sorry, from your ultraviolet through to your infrared. And um, you can actually transmit on visible light. And I've got a couple of um, little devices which Justin has brought along, which we can have a look at at the end of the presentation. Um, of this, uh, 8.3 kilohertz, all the way up to 275 gigahertz, is uh, regulated by the Australian Communications and Media Authority. So it's not just a case of being able to um, pick up a transmitter and start talking. So what does regulation mean? Uh, for, for public access to the radio spectrum, it's actually somewhat limited. Um, a lot of the radio spectrum is licensed out. Uh, think te telecommunications with your mobile devices, uh, marine HF, uh, there's a lot of mobile, um, mobile radio devices like in the taxis there, so, which are uh, people pay money for. So if you're interfering with the frequencies that people pay money for, you're very gonna, quickly going to get a knock on the door from someone saying, stop doing that. Um, the, the emission types are also limited. Usually in, in the public spectrum space, there are only some limited uh, data modes and voice that you can use, such as AM, uh, and also power. Uh, you can't expect to uh, hook up a multi-kilowatt station and hit the transmit button. Uh, again, people will not like you very much for that. But, it is, but it's not impossible to, as a member of the public to use the radio spectrum. 
Uh, there are such things as class licences. Uh, the most, most visible of this would be uh, CB. So CB works on, I think it's 470 megahertz uh, on UHF, or there's also the 27 megahertz band um, for CB, for HF. Uh, certainly many of the modern day walkie talkies use these. Um, there's also lo low power devices, LITDs, uh, which uh, you can buy as Arduino things uh, these days. And you, you can just plug into your Raspberry Pi and that, they'll tra transmit a very low power, but they will transmit. Um, again, I've got a couple of devices up the back here just to show and tell. We've got where we had at a festival of bright ideas last year, a couple of these LIPDs connected to a Raspberry Pi and allowed these two terminals to communicate with each other just using wireless RF. And of course, I've mentioned light already. Uh, there's a picture here of Justin, who's sitting up the back, uh, using one of his light transmitters. Uh, and we, uh, over several years, there was a lot, lot of um, work done with transmitting uh, tens, if not hundreds of kilometres, just using light, bouncing it off the sky, bouncing it off clouds, bouncing it off airplanes even. So it is actually, quite possible to use light as a communication platform there. Um, so that's some of the things you can do, but why would you look at amateur radio? Well, large portions of the radio spectrum are available for amateur radio experimentation. Um, there are spaces in the low frequency, around half a megahertz, 576 kilohertz or so, um, through uh, medium wave, HF, VHF, UHF, um, or, or, yeah, all, all the way th through 10, 10 gigahertz is another one which we'll probably get into with a later session today. Uh, and there are more emission modes available to us. So um, there's data modes like radio teletype, uh, slow scan and pass scan TV, um, JT, JT65 modes for weak signals. Um, yeah. But the problem with amateur radio is that it tends to have a little bit of an image problem. Um, quite often, amateur radio is usually linked to the idea of it being a bunch of old people in front of a big panel of convoluted uh, equipment. And they also have very deep pockets because a lot of that equipment is quite expensive. And look, I'm here today. I'm going to tell you right now, it is really not expensive to get into amateur radio these days. And there are a lot, you know, there, there are a lot of new things happening that particularly which have come around due to uh, the, the maker movement. Again, Arduinos and system on chips and those sort of things which are making a whole new wave of people take up amateur radio today. Um, some of these things include high altitude balloons. Uh, in Adelaide, the amateur radio experimenters group are heavily into high altitude balloons. Uh, where they'll hook sensors um, together, up, get together with Arduino with um, little lo low power transmitters. And those transmitters will tr transmit back telemetry to VHF and UHF radios. So obviously things like you can get your battery power, temperature, altitude, um, barometric pressure. You can even transmit back pictures. And as you can see there, we've got a little echidna who is experiencing the outer atmosphere there by the looks of it. Um, uh, when they all get sent back over radio, he, here closest to me, you can see where they've done the tracking. There is a, a website which is called Have Hub, which will do the tracking. Um, just for the record, uh, these slides, when they are put when they're available up on the Linux Confu wiki, will have links to all these in them. So if you don't see any links here, they'll be actually in, in the notes which you can download. So um, yeah, they're high altitude balloons. Uh, I wish I actually had one of the uh, devices here. They're quite small, about 50 grams or less, um, and they're quite amazing. Uh, if you want to go a little bit high, higher, though, than a high altitude balloon, um, we'll hit the button and hope that it moves. And now it's gone too far. Previous. Previous. Sorry about this. Um, you can have a look at low Earth orbit satellite communications. Now, Scott talked a little bit this morning about the SatMog stuff. Um, we have here one of our members of the radio club, uh, Larry, demonstrating one, another one of the portable antennas. Um, if low Earth, low Earth orbit satellites are not your thing, 
then maybe bouncing signals off the moon is. Uh, so Rex VK7, Mike Oscar, thank you. Uh, had a brain failure there for a moment. Uh, VK7 Mike o Oscar will be coming along uh, later this afternoon. We, we expect to talk about uh, transmitting signals off the moon using 10 gigahertz and the propagation that um, is required there. And finally, perhaps this is what's turning amateur radio on its head these days, is software-defined radio. Uh, like most things, technology tends to get it in the end. Uh, so uh, you, you can start as simply as a TV tuner, the RTL-SDR, which Scott had here earlier. Um, that's up in that top right there. Uh, the one uh, That was about a $50 unit off eBay, and uh, it, it will allow you to work down to about 20 megahertz or so, actually, down to about 100 kilohertz or so, because it's had a modification done to it, all the way up to about 1.8 gigahertz. Um, or if you want to go for a slightly more expensive thing, there's the Flex Radio SDR, um, which has a remote head, um, and that, that, will, that will give you a true sort of remote radio station capabilities there. So again, we have um, a software-defined radio special interest group that's starting to take off down here and holds regular meetings. And funnily enough, you can see one of our um, presenters in that uh, picture there. So there's a bit of a theme going on here. So these are just some of the cool things that are starting to come out in amateur radio. But really, you need to know how to start in amateur radio. Well, sort of the first thing you need will be a license. Uh, you cannot use the amateur radio spectrum without having a, a, a license there. And there are three types of licenses in, um, in Australia. There's the foundation license, which is pretty basic. Um, it's pretty easy to obtain too. But uh, no data modes are allowed, uh, so you can't use your radio teletype or your PSK31 or weak signal JT modes. Um, they're also very limited in frequency and limited in power. So the, the maximum power allowed to be transmitted by a foundation licensee is 10 watts peak or 5 watts continuous. Um, and there's only certain frequencies, um, probably uh, when you compare it to the standard and advance. And also, there's no home brew. Now, I don't mean the beer. Uh, you can keep drinking the beer as much as you'd like. But uh, you're not allowed to make your own transmitters um, to transmit. You have, can only buy stuff off the shelf. So if you just want to get started and just learn a little bit about radio to begin, begin with, uh, foundation might be the way to go. But I think most people here be far more interested in a standard uh, licence, which uh, has more frequencies that you're, you're allowed to use and more power. So most standard licences are allowed 100 watts peak power, which is usually used for sideband. Uh, I think it's 50 watts, I think, for continuous. Um, it, it then will go up again if you go for an advanced mode licence. And that also allows more emission modes. Um, I should say that standard does actually allow uh, the data modes. Uh, advanced has a few more exotic emission modes in it. Uh, the reason why I went from a standard to an advanced was uh, to transmit amateur television. Uh, back in the time, the standard licence didn't allow for the emission mode that amateur television required. So, um, yeah, that, so the advanced gives you a pretty good run of everything. Um, it allow, allows you to play on the 1.2 gigahertz spectrum as well, if you want to play up in 23 centimetres. Um, but that, that is sort of what you try and aspire to, I guess, there. Um, Exams. Uh, exams are held by local radio clubs on behalf of WIA qualified assessors. Um, I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a learning facilitator. Uh, I can't actually give you the exam, but I can teach you all about it. So, um, there, there is the Radio and Electronics School, which I'm a, which I'm a mentor in at res.net.au. They provide courses uh, online for standard and advanced exams. And... The, the courses are generally designed to last over about six months and are pretty comprehensive. And I should say here that we have a couple of books. Um, the Radio Theory Handbook, um, which we're going to give away as prizes a little bit later today. Um, these are actually written by Ron Bertrand, who is the um, main organiser of the Radio and Electronics School. 
So if you have one of those and study it, I'm pretty confident you'll get your advanced licence. Um, there are foundation days run by clubs as well, which will give you the opportunity to uh, take part in an instructor-led course. Usually it can take about a mor morning to a half a day, uh, followed by doing a, your practical assessment and your foundation exams. So you actually have the potential to go from knowing very little about radio to having a foundation licence um, or being ready to apply for a foundation licence all in one day. And we find those quite successful. Um, in terms of exams, there are theory exams if you're not doing a foundation course. Oh, sorry, there, there are, there are uh, multiple choice exams uh, for, for theory, which is, which is uh, all sort of separated. Um, there are also, there's also a regulations exam and a practical assessment. Um, they're a little bit more difficult, they're obviously a bit more difficult than the foundation uh, courses, which uh, tend to not be as split, split up and tend to focus on the safety aspect of radio a bit more. Um, the exams all tend to have 50 questions and have a pass mark of 35, and they're all, all multiple choice, and we're going to take a look at those in a moment here. Um, so we've got some... Uh, sample questions here from the regulations and from the standard theory. So the first question is, an amateur radio station may be closed down by the ACMA uh, when A, the interference is caused due to faults in the amateur station, or B, a planning permit has not been obtained for antenna structures, C, no accurate means of measuring transmitter power is available at the amateur station, or D, a low-pass filter fitted to the output of the transmitter overcomes the overload of the nearby equipment. And that's quite a mouthful. Um, so you can usually discount two of these um, questions here. But what I want is, is, would like to see is a show of hands here uh, on what you think the answer might be. So hands up for those who think A, interference is caused due to... Yep. Uh, B, planning permit has not been acquired. Yep. C, no accurate means of measuring the transmitter power. Yep. And D, low-pass filter has not been... Uh, yeah, I'm not even going to say that sentence again because it's a tongue twister. So the answer here is A. The, the interference is caused due to, the faults, due to faults in the amateur station. In the case of B, a planning permit, that's a local government issue. Nothing to do with uh, ACMA. Um, C and uh, C, no, we, we're not required to have a, a means of measuring the transmitter power. We do need to have some idea of what the transmitter power is, but we're not, we, just because we don't have something there to measure it doesn't mean we have to shut down. Um, or, and D, a low-pass filter overcomes the overload of nearby equipment. No. Um, the reason behind that is that there could be issues with the other equipment rather than issues with the radio station. Now, the next question, the prefix in a VK, the prefix VK in the amateur radio call sign indicates that A, the licence has been issued in Australia, B, the holder has an advanced licence, C, the call sign can only be used in Australia, or D, the radio amateur uh, holding that licence is on official ACMA business. Again, a show of hands for A. I think you're all amateur radio operators in here. <laughs> uh, B, C, D, of course, you've got it. The um, answer there is A. Um, the, the, the suffix, what we call the suffix in the call sign will uh, sort of determine whether you're an advanced standard or foundation uh, licensee. Um, the, the call sign can only be used in Australia. That's a bit of a furphy because we do have reciprocal licensing with other countries, uh, but you would need to check what the other countries' requirements are around that. And D, uh, that the radio amateur holding the licence on official ACMA business, no, they will not have, have any special call sign to designate that. Um, this one, I think, would be pretty straightforward, given the previous answers. The major Australian legislation that governs radio communications is A, the Australian Constitution, uh, B, uh, the ACMA emission statement, 
Uh, <laughs> C, the Radio Communications Act, or D, apparat apparatus licence regulations. So uh, I'm guessing everyone is going to put their hand up in a moment. But for A? Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, B? Uh, C? There we go. And D, which is uh, quite obviously legislation is all um, passed and forms Acts of Parliament, so it's Regulations Act. So just to finish off, a couple of questions on theory. Um, so which of the following are basic units of electricity? Um, Mohs, volts or amperes? Kilovolts, milliamperes and cool ohms assessor? Uh, amperes, volts and ohms? Or inductance, capacitance and resistance? So A, A, and B, C, yep, or D. So obviously there it, it is C. Um, D it is um, certainly measurements, but not the basic units of electric electricity. And the other two just have made up uh, measurements in there. Sorry? True. Sorry, I stand corrected. Um, correct. Yep. <laughs> Uh, and finally, the total resistance of four 68 ohm resistors in parallel is A, 272 ohms, uh, 12 ohms, 17 ohms, or 34 ohms. Uh, who thinks A? B, C, D. <laughs> the, the answer here, and I'm going, um, is, is C, which is uh, 17 ohms. Essentially, uh, with resistors, when they're in parallel, you, you can sort of, divide, particularly when they all have an equal um, resistance, you can sort of divide by the number of resistors uh, when in series you add. And of course, that all gets a bit harder when they're all of different values there. Um, so, costs. This is probably the all important thing. Um, getting a license. Uh, there are costs for the exams. So for each theory exam, it's $70. Um, you, only, you only need to do the regs and the practical assessment once. If you want to upgrade from a standard to an advanced licence, then that will be another $70 to do the upgraded theory course there. Once you do that, uh, you have a cost of a call sign recommendation between $5 and $20, and that depends on whether you want to choose your call sign or you're going to let the ACMA um, designate the call sign for you. Um, the ACMA also want some money for the initial licence application of $76. So all up, a cost for a new applicant doing a standard licence is around $286. Now, that's pretty comparable to many professional memberships out there. Um, so it, it is really not as expensive as it sounds, particularly because once you have, have this qualification, you have it for life. You don't have to go off and do it again every year. So you've actually done it. Yes. <laughs> um, there is also... Sorry? Um, no, you can't actually do, do the... The question was, can, can you do the course online? Um, no. Uh, all, all the courses are usually held by the assessors at a local club. It is a paper-based exam. Yeah. Okay, so, so the uh, question was, uh, what do the RES do? The RES, or Radio Electronics School, do have an on online course, but it is not the, not the exam. So you can actually do the course. You can actually go through the course and study and learn, but when it comes to the exam itself, you're still required to uh, make an application to, or contact the WIA who point you in the direction of an assessor. Um, there's also a foundation licence assessment, which does include the practical assessment for $70. So if you just want to get your feet um, just, you know, in, in the water just a little bit, just to see what it's like, see what's, see what's out there, but you're not really interested in playing with data and inve investing in lots of gear yet, getting a foundation licence might be the way to go. Um, there are also costs to keeping a licence. So the ACMA government, you've got to love them. 
um, would like $52 a year for that, um, for that benefit. Um, we also recommend that you join a club. We really recommend that you join a local club. Uh, lo local clubs are sort of the lifeblood of the ho hobby, um, getting you all together. They usually can hold events and presentations. They might have equipment for you to loan. They usually maintain repeaters for you to have access to uh, with your handheld FM radios. And um, yeah, and they're not that expensive to join. Uh, there's also the Wireless Institute of Australia, which uh, is our representative to, to government and uh, internationally as well for regulation of the amateur radio um, bands. And they're $95 a year. And uh, in that price, you obviously get the representation, you get access to their bookshop. They do a regular publication called AR Magazine, uh, which comes out each month. And really, it, it's pretty good value to be part of this and also be <coughs> represented there. Um, the final costs are the equipment. Now, I've said it's between three and thousands, if not millions of dollars. So it's a pretty big spectrum. Um, free in that uh, you might be given some equipment um, from another radio amateur to help get you started. Uh, you, you might pick something up at a tip, sh a tip shop, and that does happen. Um, on the other hand, you might want to set up a multi-station contesting set up with multiple antennas, and you're going to have very deep pockets to do that. Uh, as you can see there, if you want, you can play around with, with homebrew, uh, the crystal set radio, for, just to do receiving. You can homebrew to your heart's content uh, quite cheaply if you want to do receiving stuff. Uh, you, can, you can pick up handheld radios uh, quite cheaply on eBay these days, the things coming out of China known as the Baofangs and the, the Wuxon handhelds. Um, there's also the VK Classifieds, uh, .net .au, I think. Uh, which has a lot of second-hand radio equipment uh, for sale, as well as there being Facebook groups as well. Um, and, of course, there's the, the uh, software-defined radios that are coming up, like the Hack RF, the Lime SDR. Um, you can get Flex Radio Systems. Or you can go for something which is a little bit in between, like, a Yezu, like the most Yezu transceivers, ICOM transceivers. Um, yeah, the, the money is... Yeah, you can between cheap and lots of money. So that sort of wraps up me saying, um, are you ready for amateur radio? Uh, I do have some pamphlets up the back. There are a couple of bits and pieces we can also take a look up up the back there in the form of an LIPD terminal and we've got a couple of optical transmi transmitters up there. But I will hopefully take, have time for a couple of questions if anyone has any. Have the microphone. Do I still have to learn Morse code? No. Sweet. As of, I think it was 2004, 2005. Oh, so recent. Uh, yeah, the, 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 um, that the regulations got changed and Morse was no, long, no longer part of the... Um, Morse is still, fun! Morse is fun, and I've got to admit, I am learning Morse at the moment, <laughs> because it can be heard where your voice cannot. Possibly an un, 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 un qualifier is that yep. it's also dropped in New Zealand. But if you actually want to operate in another country, and I still think the US requires you to have a Morse component. Oh, okay. Otherwise, you'll be kind of like limited to certain bands. Yep. <laughs> so just to add, add to that, Steve, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in the US it's, it's a, it's a five-word-a-minute requirement, but the, the way they do the test there is quite clever in a sense. The US dropped their Morse code requirement 10 years ago. There you go. Okay. Yeah, you, you I speak no further. Right yeah. So th there's, there's a lot of um, reciprocal licensing that can, can occur between countries. Um, usually most advanced licensees in Australia can take their licence over to many other countries, provided they have their... T take a copy of their licence with them and be able to transmit. They, they do have to obviously check the requirements in each country, but yes. Uh, Stephen Boyd, vk one S. Just a, one minor point. Yep. Homebrew and foundation licences, as far as transmit side, don't That's right. Don't connect. So, so the foundation, you must use a commercial bit of gear and it, correct. Can't, it can't be a digital mode. Yep. Which is why you should all get your standard license. Hi, um, I'm 
Settle to UMF. Hi. Yep. Um, do you guys have repeater networks here? We do. Can you tell me about them? I can. I'll the short version, or the long if you want. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, sorry, in what sense, what, what, what would you like to know about them? As in... Okay, if I was going to tell you about New Zealand ones, I'd say that they go from the north to the south and they have uh, every second one is on a different okay. frequency and this is how you get there. Yeah. Okay, well, um, so there are certainly... Um, with our repeater networks in, in Tasmania at least, uh, there are a couple of different link-ups. There is a statewide link-up on UHF uh, between... Um, are they like digipeters? Sorry, oh, to make it more relevant. The digital digi ones are cool. Digital? I honestly can't tell you much no. about them. We don't have any digipeters down here. Other digi than okay, they're like repeaters, but... Oh, other, than, um, a a a other than APRS digipeters. Okay, we have um, repeaters. Some of ours are designated for voice and some are designated for digital. So, so yeah, you don't want to just transmit digital over someone's conversation, so... Yeah, um, honestly, I can't tell you much about them uh, down here because we don't Maybe your really country's just really big. Okay. <laughs> Look, we'll take just one more because um, we're running out of time yep. and um, then any other questions come and see me uh, as so, expect. So I'm interested in getting a license but I spend a lot of time in the US and here. Yep. Where should I apply for a license and are they reciprocal? That's a very good question. Oh, you get them both. Yeah. yeah. He's going to get both. Oh, yeah. Yep. You do not have to be a U.S. citizen to achieve a license in the U.S. And most tests yeah. are in the in U.S. are administered by volunteers, and there are sessions typically once a month. And most of those s test sessions, which are locally run, will allow you to sit for multiple license classes in the same sitting. So you can you can keep testing for new levels until you fail, and then you'll have achieved whatever level you pass. <laughs> okay, well, th thank you everyone. Um, yeah. We'll have a quick break to uh, allow uh, um, other people to set up here. Yeah. And um, if you have any questions, yeah, I'll, obviously I'm around all week. Um, certainly in, in here during the afternoon tea break, so feel free to grab a hold of me. Thanks very much. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much, Ben.